your specialty is long range outlooks for tropical development in the Atlantic. What are you seeing big picture stuff right now that leads you to believe that we may have an active season in the Atlantic this year? Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we are expecting a pretty active hurricane season coming up in 2024. Um, one of the big factors is El Nino, which is warmer than normal water in the central and eastern tropical Pacific, which we had last year, is very likely to be gone. It's already weakening quite quickly and likely to be transitioning potentially over to La Nina. Actually looks pretty good chance will be to La Nina, which is Basically the opposite of El Nino, it's colder than normal water in the central and eastern tropical Pacific. And why what goes on in the Pacific matters is because it changes kind of how the upper level winds, so the winds at 20, 30,000 feet respond in the Atlantic in such a way that it reduces levels of what's known as vertical wind shear. Vertical wind shear is a change in wind speed and direction with height in the atmosphere. Too much of that shear tears apart hurricanes as they're trying to develop and intensify. It tilts the circulation, disrupts the formation, and so vertical wind shear is good for us, bad for the hurricane. So specifically, going into a La Nina, what does that mean for the upper level winds? Yeah, so the upper level winds, normally in the Atlantic, your winds are near the ocean surface, blow out of the east in the tropics, and at upper levels, they blow out of the west. So when you have low level winds going one direction, upper level winds going the other, that means that you have a lot of shear. When those upper, those in, El, in La Nina years, those upper level westerly winds are significantly reduced. So you have less overall of that vertical wind shear. And that combined with right now, we saw a record warm tropical Atlantic water temperatures. That provides more fuel for hurricanes, also tends to make the atmosphere more unstable, helping to basically form these systems coming off of Africa. Overall, that combination of La Nina and a very warm Atlantic typically leads to very active hurricane seasons. Uh, another factor that you mention and look at is pressure, surface pressures mm -hmm. over the Atlantic Basin. Mm -hmm. and you're indicating that you're seeing them as a little bit lower than normal or in past years? Yeah, and so, if we go back to about a year ago, um, the tropical Atlantic last, say, February, even in early March, the water temperatures were, were pretty much near average. Um, and between about March and June of last year, the tropical Atlantic warmed tremendously quickly. And so, you know, when we talk about climate change and how that impacts um, you know, water temperatures, climate change kind of loads the dice towards warmer waters, but when you get a big shift between, say, March and June, that's not climate change, right? That's something else going on, and that's basically changes in the atmospheric circulation. So the subtropics, which normally the pressure is high, that's where your Bermuda high is, your Azores high, those pressures drop tremendously, and when you have lower pressure in the subtropics, what that tends to do is basically weaken the winds blowing across the tropical Atlantic in response. When you have weaker winds, you get less evaporation. Less evaporation means less evaporational cooling, which means the waters warm quite quickly. And those pressures, in general, have remained lower than normal, which is one of the reasons why that extremely warm Atlantic that we had all of last year has persisted. It's, it's obviously cooled since last summer, but it hasn't cooled as much as it, we would have liked it to have seen it cool. It's, it's still quite warm out there. So we're still record warm um, in the, most of the tropical Atlantic right now. Those warm waters are important in the number of storms that form, it can increase them. Can you please tell me where the hurricanes are gonna actually go and land? <laughs> well, you know, one of the big things that we saw last year was we had a ton of storms. We had 20 storms, yeah. which is a tremendous number, especially in a strong El Nino year. Uh, normally, strong El Nino really knocks down your storms due to increases in shear. Last year, the shear was quite low, and part of that is because the Atlantic was so hot, we didn't kind of get the overall tropical circulation change we normally expect in a strong El Nino year. Um, but that those low pressures also helped to kind of recurve the storm. So we had a lot of systems coming off Africa, but most of them just went out into the open ocean. Okay, that's fine. I mean, obviously we had Idalia, which is by far the most significant storm of the year, but from an impacts perspective, fairly benign year. Um, when we also didn't get much storm formation in the Caribbean, basically it was Idalia and that was it. You know, and, and so that's, a, that's more of a typical El Nino signal. Whereas this year, coming up, La Nina tends to broadly very, very, not a huge signal, but there's a little bit of a signal for more move, storms moving straight as opposed to recurving. But also in La Nina years, your Caribbean tends to be a lot busier, so which obviously means obviously more impacts in that region, potentially, but also if storms form in the Caribbean and there happens to be kind of a low pressure that drags them north, then obviously you're talking about more impacts for say the Gulf and especially for Florida, maybe all the way up the Eastern seaboard. So when you look at the relationship between La Nina and 
landfalling storms, you do see a considerable signal, especially for the Caribbean, mm -hmm. but also for uh, more Florida up to Maine than Texas to Alabama. You see a little bit of an increase from Texas to Alabama, mm -hmm. but more of a dramatic increase from Florida to Maine, mainly due to the fact that Gulf storms don't have quite as strong of signals with the large scale climate because Gulf also can basically home grow storms. Yeah. And those, the relationship between El Nino, La Nina, and those is, is fairly weak because those can come off of fronts coming from the mid latitudes, and those just don't have as bit much of a signal with kind of the normal large scale climate features, which is what we use to, to predict the overall seasons. You know, one of the things that always, I don't know if it scares me, but it concerns me every season is 1957, we had a hurricane that formed in the southern Gulf, in the Bay of Campeche, and quickly became Cat 4. Mm -hmm. This was early in the season, this was June. Yeah. Yeah. That's the type of system that, that keeps me up at night. Um, are we seeing any signals that that type of thing can happen this year? I mean, that's, that's really, that's governed more by like day-to-day -day weather patterns, yeah. lots of stuff, you know. You, so we do, in addition to our seasonal forecasts, we also do shorter term, so we do two week forecasts at Colorado State. Now, if you go, if you go shorter than that, that's where you, the Hurricane Center goes out a week, and their outlooks are fantastic, and I look at them very, all the time. But we go out to two weeks trying to kind of highlight, and when you get to two weeks, you can go to more than just saying, you know, it's going to be busy. You can start to kind of look for areas that might form. So for example, you know, it was around August the, I think, 18th or so, we put out a forecast last year and said, you know, the next two weeks look very busy, but, and most of most interest probably is something, potentially something forming in the Western Caribbean and then heading north up into the Gulf. At that point, we didn't know, you know, what it was going to be, how strong it was going to be, but we could start to kind of highlight more threat regions once you get out to about two weeks. Prior to that, it's just, it's hard, you have to one, know where the storm's gonna form, and then you have to know kind of how it's going to be steered. And obviously, you know, that is critical for how much of impacts you see. I mean, a storm like Idalia obviously was very impactful for the Big Bend, but there's just not a lot of people there. So from a overall financial damage, overall, you know, fatality toll, thankfully, both were fairly low. Whereas obviously, had you run Idalia 100 miles farther southeast into Tampa, then would be a whole different story in terms of its impacts. Um, Tell me about why you're here at the National Hurricane Conference. Yeah, so the National Hurricane Conference is, is, is an awesome meeting in that it, it combines meteorology, the meteorologists are here, the media is here, you have your emergency managers, your fire police, um, you know, you have private industry. So basically everyone kind of talking about kind of lessons learned from the previous hurricane season and, you know, new techniques, new tools that are available. And so it's kind of a good way to kind of discuss like, hey, you know, we responded to this hurricane last year. This went awesome. This was a complete and utter failure. You know, how can we learn? So, you, you know, so that if someone makes a mistake, they can say, don't make, you know, if you live over here, don't repeat what we did. Or, hey, this worked great. Here's how maybe you could do your messaging differently. This worked really well in our area. Uh, so it's a really valuable exchange of information from people from a broad variety of, you know, walks of, walks of life. It, it's a neat conference that kind of takes anybody who's doing anything regarded to a hurricane response or just with the hurricane preparation and brings them all together in one spot. My home is Houston Galveston. Mm -hmm. What message can you give the residents as we go into this hurricane season about being prepared? What should they be thinking about yeah, I mean, I think the thing is, you know, you need to be prepared every hurricane season, regardless of outlooks from us or any other group, because no one can tell you, you know, once in advance when or where storms are going to go. And, you know, we always say it only takes one storm, because um, obviously it does. You can have a very, very quiet season like 1983, which obviously had only four storms all year. But the A storm formed very late, late August, but obviously Alicia was very devastating for Houston area. But in general, more active seasons do have more landfalling storms. You can get lucky. But in general, you know, if you say, okay, you take all your really busy seasons and look at the number of landfalls, it is dramatically up from, say, a bunch of very quiet seasons. Um, and that's just basically because there's more storms that are out there and you put enough storms out there, some people are likely to get impacted probably quite significantly. So, you know, now's the time to just have a plan in place, know what you're going to do if storms do threaten. And then, you know, if the storms do threaten, to follow the advice of your local emergency managers because they can tell you best. They know your area really well, so they can tell you whether you should be, you know, evacuating or sheltering in place. Yeah. Um, quite often we go into a hurricane season, the buildup, it begins on June the 1st and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And complacency builds in. Uh, your predecessor, Dr. Gray, he used to ring a bell on, I believe, August the 20th, which is what he believed was the real beginning of the meat of hurricane season. Tell me a little bit about why people should not let their guard down, even if it's a quiet start. Yeah, that's, that's and it's an excellent point. I think last year really, really drove that message home. Um, we look at last year and 
we had had a couple of storms in June, so it got off to kind of a busy start. And then we went through July, there was one, one hurricane, but it was out in the middle of nowhere. And then we went through August, August 10th, August 15th, nothing, dead quiet. And so if you looked at the National Hurricane Center's tropical weather outlook on August 19th, we had no active storms, but they had like five, I think five different areas they were monitoring. And then August 20th, the day the bell rang, <laughs> all the storms came. And so Dr. Gray passed away in 2016, but we still ring a bell every year in his, in his memory. And certainly the bell rang with great gusto last year. We had 13 storms formed between August 20th and September 28th. So if you do the math, that's one in about every three days. It was insanely busy during that time. Again, thankfully not much in the way of impacts, but you know, June, July, normally kind of what keeps your season from ramping up earlier is that stuff is kind of, it tends to be a little too dry um, and the waters, it tends to be a little too stable. Um, we get to about mid-August, the stability and everything else tends to basically become more conducive for hurricanes. It becomes more unstable. You tend to see less of those, that dry air coming off Africa and those dust outbreaks. And the shear is also still very low. Um, the peak of the season is September 10th. And then normally after that, even though the water temperatures continue to warm a little more, the shear tends to, ele to, to escalate fairly quickly, which is why the season in the Atlantic is extremely peaked, much more peaked than, say, the typhoon season. Uh, you get a lot of your storm activity between about August 20th and October 10th, historically. They can obviously fall outside of those bounds, but that's really kind of your real peak, the peak of the peak of the season.